This is Imaging of Pelvic Inflammatory Disease Part 1. I'm Dr. Dan Koval. So in Part 1, I'll talk about the early and late manifestations of PID and also the CT and ultrasound appearance. And we'll discuss pink's tube ovarian abscess and how to differentiate that from tube ovarian complex. And we'll also discuss treatment options. So let's start with a case. So this was a patient who came in through the emergency department with acute lower abdominal pain and fever. And you can see that there's a mild left hydronephrosis with left perinephric stranding and even a delayed left nephrogram. So your initial thought may be to consider a distal obstructing ureteral calculus. But as we move into the pelvis, you can see that there are actually complex bilateral adnexal collections left greater than right. And this was a patient with pelvic inflammatory disease. So pelvic inflammatory disease is a common cause of acute pelvic pain. Approximately 1 million patients are diagnosed yearly, and most commonly this is associated with STDs and maybe polymicrobial. The two most common offenders are chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea, but other less common etiologies uh, such as tuberculosis and actinomycosis can also occur. A note about actinomycosis, this is an invasive organism that leads to a chronic superlative infection and more commonly associated with patients that have an uh, intrauterine device. And because it's so invasive in appearance, it can be difficult to differentiate from carcinomatosis. So PID is most common in premenopausal women, and usually it's an infection that begins as an ascending infection from the vagina or the cervix. So this infection will lead to endometritis, which is inflammation of the endometrium, salpingitis, which is inflammation of the fallopian tubes, pile salpinks, when the tube becomes obstructed and fills with pus, and then tube ovarian abscess due to periovarian adhesions. This is that same patient with ultrasound showing that the tubes are dilated uh, fluid and debris filled and located posterior to the uterus. Additional images showing that there is a actual pus debris level that changes position with the patient and there's also peripheral hyperemia. Common findings in PID, this patient underwent bilateral ultrasound guided drainage. So let's talk about the early findings of PID. So they can be subtle. Um, you might see mild pelvic edema resulting in haziness of the pelvic fat, as you can see here. This is actually one of the most sensitive findings seen in 65% of patients. You can also see thickening of the uterosacral ligaments, which I'll talk about in a minute. The fallopian tubes themselves can become thickened in the setting of salpingitis, and studies have shown that greater than 5 millimeters in axial dimension on CT is actually 95% specific for salpingitis. Here's an ultrasound case showing that tubal thickening. You might also see mild ovarian enlargement and even a possible polycystic appearance in the setting of oophoritis or ovarian inflammation, as you can see here. And then periovarian stranding and enhancement of the adjacent peritoneum can occur. Finally, if you have abnormal endometrial enhancement with fluid in the endometrial canal, that can be a sign of early endometritis, as in this case. So uteral sacral ligaments are actually paired ligaments between the lower uterine segment and the anterior sacrum. Here's an example of normal uterosacral ligaments, thin and curvilinear. In the setting of early PID, you can get thickening of these ligaments and then haziness of the surrounding periorectal and presacral fat. Now with later findings of PID, you start getting progressive wall thickening and enhancement of the fallopian tubes, and complex fluid and debris accumulates in the tubes, leading to pile salpinks and that uh, dilated tube will still typically conform to a C or an S shape, and that's a key finding that I'll keep bringing up. So here you can see on this ultrasound there is thickening of the tubal wall, and there's debris in the tube, but you still see this C shape. Uh, some additional later findings. You might see peripheral hyperemia around the dilated inflamed tube, which you can see on color or in power Doppler, as in this case. And remember, power Doppler is a bit more sensitive than color Doppler, but gives you no information on direction of flow of blood. Also, another finding that's fairly specific for tubal inflammation is the cogwheel sign, and that's typical of tubal inflammation in the setting of PID. What you'll see is thickening of the longitudinal folds within the tube, giving you this cogwheel appearance, as in this case. That will help you differentiate tube from bowel or ovarian neoplasm. Now, here's an example of how that cogwheel sign can help you. This was a patient that came into the emergency department with abdominal pain. You can see these tubular fluid-filled structures in the inferior pelvis on this coronal reformatted CT image, you may initially think that this is bowel. If we cone in, though, and look at the axial images, you can identify S and also uh, C shape here on the sagittal image. Let me zoom in. You can see that S shape um, that makes you wonder, is this dilated tube? If we cone in even further, then you can start seeing these little 
nodules on the uh, internal component of the tube indicating the thickened longitudinal folds of the cogwheel sign. And then looking also at ultrasound on this patient, again the cogwheel sign there indicating uh, tubal inflammation. There's also peripheral hyperemia here on these color Doppler images. And this was a patient that had uh, PID with bilateral cell pinchitis. Now some more advanced later findings of PID. Once pyosalpinks and tubovarian abscesses start to form, you'll see these thick-walled complex fluid collections that may have internal septations with fluid debris levels, as I showed you on that earlier case. And then you may even see gas, although that's not quite as common as gas within other abdominal pelvic abscesses, which is a bit counterintuitive. Uh, in this case, there is actually a gas containing left adnexal collection indicating a tubovarian abscess. There's also gas in, in a normally enhancing fluid-filled endometrium indicating endometritis. And then what about in the right ovary? There's another rim-enhancing collection. Is this a second abscess? Well, if we zoom in, you can see that this rim has an undulated, uh, thick-walled, crenulated margin. This is classic for a physiologic corpus luteum, not an abscess. Now, if we look at that same patient on ultrasound, you can see the tubovarian abscess will be a multi-loculated mass with septations and irregular margins. You'll have complete or near-complete loss of the adnexal architecture, meaning you normally won't see much normal ovarian tissue. In this case, you can see these echogenic uh, foci of dirty shadowing within the abscess indicating gas. And then you do see a bit of normal ovary there, although it's distorted and only partially imaged. And this is a typical tubovarian abscess. So differentiate that from a tubovarian complex, which is seen in the setting of salpingoopharitis without abscess. You'll be able to identify ovary separate from the tube, but the ovary will be partially fused to the tubal fimbriae, meaning you cannot separate the ovary from the tube by pushing with the transducer, which is an important dynamic ultrasound finding. So let me show you another case. So this is a patient with a collection on the right and then what looks like a dilated fluid-filled tube on the left on CT scan. Looking at the patient's ultrasound, we see a tubovarian abscess on the right. On the left, you see this uh, fluid and debris-filled tube posterior to the uterus. Again, there is another image. And then looking at the axial or transverse image, you can see that there's a right tubovarian abscess. And on the left, you do see normal but inflamed ovary adjacent to a debris-filled tube. That's a tubovarian complex on the left and a tubovarian abscess on the right. And then the uterus is identified anteriorly between these structures. So why differentiate between these two? Well, that's important for treatment. So typically, if you have a tubovarian complex, which is uh, salpingoopharitis, that's typically treated with antibiotics. However, once an abscess forms, that usually needs to go into drainage or surgery if severe. So you can see this is a patient with a large uh, multiloculated left tubovarian abscess. We don't see any normal ovarian architecture. And there's marked thickening of the uterosacral ligaments with periurectal and presacral fat stranding on CT and extensive peripheral hyperemia on color Doppler ultrasound. This patient went on to have uh, CT-guided drainage percutaneously of that left tubovarian abscess. Now, a note about uh, tubovarian complex location. Posterior dependent position of the pyosalpinges and tubovarian abscesses is common, and associated anterior displacement of the broad ligament uh, mesosalpinx indicates that the abscess is likely ovarian or tubulin origin. Remember that the portion of the broad ligament that forms the mesentery of the fallopian tube is the mesosalpinx, and here you can see that displaced anteriorly by these posterior um, bilateral tubovarian abscesses. This will help you differentiate TOA from other types of pelvic abscesses. Also, even though this is a non-contrast study, uh, note that you can see this extensive anterior pelvic fat stranding, which is uh, classic for pelvic inflammatory disease. However, though uh, tubovarian abscess location can be variable, in this patient there are bilateral anterior complex uh, fluid collections or masses in the adnexa. Uh, one might originally consider that these could represent cystic ovarian neoplasms uh, given their location, but these did turn out to be bilateral tubovarian abscesses. You can also see some mild fat straining in the pelvis, which is a clue. All right, that's it for part one. In part two, I'll talk about how MRI can be helpful in evaluating patients with pelvic inflammatory disease and also review additional cases. Please visit radiologisthq.com for references for this lecture. Thank you.